Here's uh, Brittany, raise your hand. Brittany Affolter, Alf is that how I say it right? I get it right, Kane. Uh, Ivy Lewis, Ivy, raise your hand. Uh, Sean Duval, raise your hand, and Mike Klein. So what we're gonna focus on today is um, what we, I'm calling the human factors, and that is uh, how is this all impacting us in terms of, uh, in terms of our own selves, in terms of the stress, in terms of uh, the uh, different worries we have, uh, the different ways we're reacting, and, and the stories of what's going on, because everybody has their own little drama of things that have been happening in their lives. Uh, we just had one this morning where we had a, we decided we had a work crew out to our house and now we just got a text that one of the work crew uh, has been tested positive for COVID. So, you know, we, we were waiting to hear, the, the people actually were at our house were not tested positive, but one of their crewmates. So now we got to figure out uh, is it safe to go on a vacation with our 98 year old mother-in-law next week? So all these, these little dramas are, are occurring. So I'm just going to let um, each of the speakers introduce themselves and then maybe we could break into talking about this and then we're going to have everybody break into small groups. Um, Emily Freund, who's my assistant, has become adept at breaking us into small groups, and everybody will have a chance to talk to three, to, to groups of three, will talk themselves about this, and then we'll report back. So I'm going to just jump right in, and um, maybe Mike, you could kick us off and tell us a little bit about who you are, and maybe take about five minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump to the other people and talk about the impact of this on you professionally and personally, and, uh, and go from there. Sure, sure. So first off, I know I said this, Rob, before when it was just us on the line, but I want to make sure that we congratulate you and Pat for 50 years of a happy marriage. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, not to be overlooked is quite an accomplishment, and uh, it's very uh, inspiring to see. No, that's very nice of you. And, and Mike pointed out that we were married at eight. We had a very special service uh, <laughs> where <laughs> they enabled us to be married, but we, we were very you know, this term blessed uh, is one uh, I don't often use, but I really feel like that fits into this situation. We're very fortunate to uh, have had health during those 50 years and supportive family and, uh, you know, very, uh, very good life in Ann Arbor, uh, University of Michigan. So it's, it's all been quite good. Thank you. So, uh, let me start off by just getting a little background of what we do at Genomenon so everybody has a little bit of context of, of what we do. We're connecting patient DNA with the billions of dollars of genomic research that's being done every year. And we're doing that to two ends. One is to help uh, cure babies with rare, with rare diseases and, uh, um, and uh, uh, help cure cancer as well. So we're using informatics. We've got two incredible founders that have built the company from ground up, spun out of the University of Michigan. Uh, one is a MD, PhD molecular pathologist, and Steve Schwartz who's actually, I see him on the line here as well, is our CTO who has the big data uh, architecture background and was able to bring Mark's to reality. Um, what um, we're selling to is, is we're selling a genetic, uh, a genetic search engine, genomic search engine, into genetic testing labs, and that's half our business. And the other half of our business is selling genomic data sets to pharma to help them understand uh, and discover the molecular drivers for, or the genetic drivers for rare diseases and for cancer. Um, we talk about the impact of COVID-19 and um, you know, coming into, uh, or coming out of March or the middle of March when we all picked up our laptops and went home and went 100% remote, about that same time, uh, there was a letter uh, that went out to the venture community and quickly shared with all the CEOs from Sequoia that basically said, everybody gird your loins, here's coming a pretty significant impact. Um, and, uh, and from there, we were in the middle of our Series A. I had, had discussions and I had five different investors, uh, venture investors in our deal room. We're having conversations about pricing and how we were going to close our Series A round. And of course, all that went sideways um, within quite literally within four days, we went from all these conversations to every investor saying they're putting everything on hold, they're focusing on their current portfolio. Um, and so we started the, the second quarter uh, with a lot of trepidation, uh, not knowing where our funding was going to come from. We had a very kind of a very short runway of cash. 
um, not knowing how our customers were going to react because, and I think everybody was trying to understand what was going to happen in the market, where customers going to buy anything or not. Um, we made some, so from a, from a company perspective, we cut 20% of our staff and 20% of our expenses to extend our runway. Um, and then in that uncertainty, we applied for the PPP loan and we were able to, to capture the PPP loan. And then um, we reached out and started conversations with our current investors. And to my surprise, we actually tripled the amount of money we were looking to raise from a bridge, uh, bridge perspective. Uh, and it very successfully extended our runway for another two years. Actually, we expect to be profitable uh, before we, uh, you know, with the cash runway that we've got from our investors. Um, and it turns out that um, the second quarter was the best quarter the company's ever had from a, from a sales and revenue perspective. Our genetic testing lab customers continued to buy and upgrade. And our pharma companies had more time to spend with their data than they, because they couldn't go into their labs, right? So a lot of the budget on doing wet lab testing uh, wasn't being used and they decided to invest that into data and the data that could be looked at from their scientists at home. So uh, we had a very, um, you know, what started off to be a very uh, trepidatious beginning of the second quarter turned out to be uh, at the end of the second quarter, a very successful story to tell. Now we're going into the third quarter, which is a always traditionally difficult uh, to find people that are because so many buyers are on vacation and a lot of our European customers are on holiday for six weeks or more. Um, and we don't know what the economy is going to do, right? So that we haven't eliminated kind of that loss of visibility into the future, but we have a lot more comfort in our ability to survive that future all the way through the end of next year. You know, I think the biggest thing we're thinking about from a people impact side is how do you su support a remote environment? You know, all of a sudden everybody lifted up their laptops, they went home, their kids, you know, for those that had young kids, they're in an environment where, um, you know, not everybody has a separate office they can go to. They've got uh, kids jumping into conference calls. I was on a call with a vice president of very large pharma and her teenage boy was in the background waving his hands and jumping up and down. And, and you know, just a, it changes the environment, it lightens things up. And you've got, you know, young kids at home and, and uh, some of our some of our employees have uh have um, spouses or partners that are working on the front line uh, of healthcare, and they're bringing that concern and that anxiety home with them. And so, um, you know, going from an environment where I, I love going to the office and seeing everybody, trying to figure out how we're going to run as 100% remote. Um, our employees like that. We're reconfiguring our office. So when we get back, it's going to be a much more collaborative come in for a day, a day and a half a week environment. We're hiring five new people and we've really lifted the restrictions on instead of looking for the best talent we can find locally, we're looking for the best talent we can find uh, anywhere in the country that can help us grow because we just recognize that we're gonna be remote for a year. So let's just build this company um, kind of from the ground up being a remote company. I think as a leader, it brings a lot of questions and concerns about how do we make sure we stay focused on the mission? How does everybody in, in really ingest that mission when you're not there every day to talk about it? How do we make sure that our culture is preserved or, or the new culture that we're building as a remote organization? I don't have the answers to that. I've spent a lot of time asking a lot of questions trying to figure that out because I think that is uh, the job of a leader is to make sure that everybody's on the same page from a mission and culture side and building a remote organization I think squares that challenge uh, it makes it much more difficult to do. So I'd be interested when we break out in small groups to hear what, uh, what everybody thinks about that and how they manage that situation. And then I'll just leave with, with one other, uh, just kind of a perspective that, you know, I think it's easy to look at the news. It's easy to, to look at the challenges that we all face. And um, you know, my wife and I were reflecting a, a couple of days ago about Wow, in the world that we're living in today, so much better today than 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Trying to imagine running a remote business because we had hit by this pandemic 20 years ago. How challenging that would be without Zoom, without really good email tools or without other tools that, that were really effective. We'd all be on conference calls trying to figure this out, right? And, um, and Tom Hanks pointed out in an interview recently that my, my wife saw that um, you know the, the world we had in World War II, and you think about World War II, and I guess he just came out with a movie on that, where the nation faced and walked into World War II 
not knowing how long this was going to last. It, was going to, it could last as far as many people knew, 10, 10 for their 20 uh, something old children or 18 year old something children on the front lines were being taken prisoner of war and how the country rallied together to solve that problem. Um, you know, this obstacle looks small in light of, of what I think are, you know, my, certainly my father-in-law and mother-in-law faced during World War II. And I think it helps to have a little perspective when people ask us to wear masks that it's not the end of the world, right? Compared to what the great generation sacrificed to get us through World War II. So I think sometimes it helps a little bit to keep that perspective in mind is, yeah, this is challenging, but we're all gonna get through it and we're gonna do fine and get through the other side. We have as a country have faced much bigger challenges and we've come out well on the other side as well. So I'll leave it at that, uh, Rob, and pass it back to you. Thank you, Mike. And Mike is a longtime friend of mine. And, and Mike, how many, this is like your third or fourth business now that you've been uh, CEO of with? Fourth, yeah, fourth company. Yeah, so you really do get that designation of serial entrepreneur. Well, yeah, well, we've seen, you know, I've, I've lived through the challenges in 2000 in the dot-com bust and, uh, and lived through 2008, right? So we have a little bit of a playbook to look at and know how to respond and react to the challenges that are thrown at us. But it's different. Steve is out there. Steve Schwartz, can you uh, take the mic for a second? I know you also are multiple times uh Want to say hi, Steve, to everybody? And yeah, sure. How's it going? I'm here. Uh, my camera's off. I was feeding my uh, my daughter. There you go. <laughs> okay. We're working from home with children, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, Steve, how, how many businesses is this for you now? Oh, um, I, it's either I, I, four or five. Yeah, it looks like your daughter is that your daughter. She admires you. She says four or five. I can't believe it. Look at that. She looks like. Are you kidding me? And yeah. I knew Steve when he was a kid, right? So Steve, before when we first met, you were still like a teenager, I think. You know. <laughs> the, yeah, it was the kid out of the garage, right? Yeah, it was a long time ago. I think uh, at that time, I think I was working on either my first or second company um, right out of college when we first met. Wow. So Steve, what's it like from the development side to try to work remote? Um, for us, it's, it's not a whole lot different. We already had a, a remote team um, before the pandemic happened on the development side. Like we had um, one of our lead developers is uh, based out of Tennessee and we were actually in the process um, of hiring another developer out of uh, Indiana. Um, when the pandemic hit and we got all the, the stay at home orders. So, um, and even the developers that worked remotely, um, we often had them working from home. They were probably working from home two days a week already, um, just because, you know, that tends to be where uh, they could get a lot of their work done. They could actually focus and, and work on the the hard problems um, that they usually need to <laughs> stay focused on for you know hours at a time without interruptions. So, um, as I think the biggest thing that's happened is just um, no longer having like in-person events, local meetups that a lot of them were going to, like the local uh -huh. you know Python user groups or the local machine learning user groups. Um, that that a lot of us um, enjoyed going to now they're all remote which on one hand is is kind of nice because i can attend more of them like this which you know i probably wouldn't have been able to make today if it were yeah. in person um but on the other hand you know all of that sort of uh interaction face-to-face -face interaction goes out the window so um that's probably the biggest difference so it sounds like your daughter's pretty interested in what you do. Could you introduce us? We have, I think she might be the youngest uh, Leaders Connect participant I've ever had. So yeah, this is uh, Gemma, and she is almost eight months old. Good morning, Gemma. Girl, say hi to Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> My oldest is uh, still in bed sleeping. Okay, how old is she? Uh, she's three. Three. Oh wow, you got a full house. Yep. How about your, you have a working wife too, or is she able to? Yeah, I have uh, my wife's a pediatric nurse practitioner wow. uh, who works three days a week. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a it's a busy house here. I imagine you got any uh, outside people coming in to help with the kids, or are you? 
Oh, that's been one of the toughest parts. We actually, we did, we had, um, we, we first hired uh, someone to come in and help watch the kids the days that um, my wife was working. Um, Roger, who's that in the background? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, cute. First grand very cute. Grand. <laughs> I thought I'd give your daughter something to look at. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, no, we hired someone and about uh, three or four days after we hired her, um, her dad, who she lived with, had to get tested for COVID because he was a, a local police officer. Oh, wow. um, and so we went through all this work to find someone who you know, seemed uh, good and responsible and taking things seriously and, and um, actually was someone who was furloughed from her daycare. And about four days after we brought her on, she had to quit. Um, and then uh, my wife got furloughed for a couple months. And then when she went back to work about a month ago, um, we had to find someone else. And then about a week and a half after we found her, um, her job called her back in. Wow. And so she had to stop watching them. So are it's been- Are really you looking tough. again? What's that? Are you looking again if anybody knows somebody? So right now we actually very uh, cautiously and nerve wrackingly have them in daycare a couple days a week. Okay. Um, so that's what we're doing now. Uh, they're taking a, a lot of precautions um, and there's only like a couple other kids that are in the daycare with them. So wow. okay. um, still pretty nerve wracking though. Like every single morning we have to take them in. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to uh, Ivy next. Ivy's could probably relate to this. Uh, Ivy out there? Yeah, I have a three-year-old and five-year-old at home as well. Um, actually, I, I thought I'd do it a little bit different. I'd prepare a couple of slides. Is that okay if I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Um, it's disabled screen sharing. So Emily, are you there to able, enable the screen sharing? Should get you set up. Okay, as we're doing that, I can uh, introduce myself. First of all, thank you, Rob, for inviting me. Um, my name is Ivy Lewis. I'm the owner of DL Consulting, which I started about a year ago. It's a project management consulting firm where I offer project management uh, coaching and consulting. And I'm here to share with you my story on how did I manage uh, the change of the crisis. So I grew up in China. I wanna share with you the word crisis and how it's written in Chinese. As you see on the screen, it's actually a phrase by two characters. When you look at it deeply, uh, each character have different meanings. The first one means danger, and the second one means opportunity. So if you put the words together, it's saying that crisis is danger and opportunity. And you guys probably know a famous quote from Kennedy is that be aware of the danger and also look for the opportunity. So when COVID started, um, I want to share with you that how did I seek for that opportunity? When I started my business a year ago, it was very typical consulting and coaching business. So how I reached my customer is by referral, networking in person, and my coaching is in person in Starbucks, my consulting is at a customer site. So those doesn't work when the crisis started. Beginning of this year, I decided to find new ways to transform my business and how I reach my customer. So I find my first opportunity is that content marketing with video. Six months ago, I don't know how to create a video. I don't know even how to create presentations like this. So I took a lot of training. I get very uncomfortable on camera, so I try to overcome that. And I started my first YouTube channel. And I create video regularly. I post video on LinkedIn as well. At that time, I'm a new YouTuber. I had about a thousand connections on LinkedIn only. So with that, I also joined lots of different platforms um, to talk to project managers, answer their questions. From that platform, I find my second opportunity is that a lot of project managers, they, grow, um, they graduate from a degree program, but they don't know how to apply that into their first project management job. So with that, I took that second opportunity and I created my first online course. And that's Jumpstart Project Management course, where I also teaching through video, show project managers 
how to apply that knowledge in their project management experience. So through these six months experience of changing how I reach my customers, my audience, how I uh, deliver my service differently, and also contribute in this project management community, I now have over a thousand subscribers on, on YouTube, and I have over 3,000 followers on LinkedIn, versus six months ago, I had none on YouTube and I had about a thousand. It's a very small win, and for a small business owner like me, but going through this process, I want to share with you my story, how I seek the opportunity. Uh, this is a journey, and this is a beginning. I'm continuing to looking like uh, looking for how do I change my business going forward, continue rest of this year to make the most out of it. So with that, I want to um, leave with this quote for you guys: "Is a crisis contains." an opportunity. So as a leader, and especially a business owner, I think it's very important as we're living through this crisis, we maintain a very positive mindset and focus on seeking that opportunity, which is best for you and your business. So this is my story, and I look forward to joining the breakout group and hear about your story as well. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it back to Rob. Evie, could you talk a little bit about more on the personal side with a three and a five year old and a uh, working husband and uh, trying to work from the house. How has that been for you uh, from the human side? Yeah, happy to. Uh, certainly a similar struggle as what Steve talked about. Um, kids run into my meeting all the time. I really had to establish different structures of different schedules. Uh, I break out my work hours very scatteredly. I work early in the morning and late at night and during the time that when kids are napping in the afternoon. So I really adjust how I work to accommodate my full-time working husband and the two kids at home, establish a different structure. It is difficult, it is um, uh, very stressful. I think it's also forced us to be creative with our, how we work, our schedules, and our um, appreciate the people around us. My parents are here visiting and they stuck because of the COVID. So it's really a challenge with our, how we co-locate in one house and be able to divide all the housework and the babysitting. And it actually helped with our relationship as a family, make us appreciate each other more, uh, work together on going through this hard time. Fantastic. So can you make a video of um, like take, for example, uh, Mike's business and help them tell their story? Is that something that you're, you're, you're working on at this point? Is that an example of that? Yeah, I'm working a lot on storytelling with video for the business owners. So certainly that's something we can do. Yeah. All right. Great. And I want to, I'm going to make a video of you telling your story because it's an interesting story. <laughs> Thank and you, Rob. You will turn the tables. Ivy did a really great interview of uh, Mike uh, Ann Leitner and myself a uh, series that she cut into pieces about our new book, uh, which is uh, out now about leadership 4.0. And uh, it's about bringing the soft skills to tech leadership. It's called Tech Leadership 4.0. So I appreciate that. So we're going to go next to Sean. Uh, Sean, are you out there? Yeah, Sean, you coming to us from your limousine or is it, you're actually at home at this point? Sean, I don't think we can hear you. Did you get your mic on? Let's see what's going on. Still don't hear. How about now? There we go. Okay. Okay, is that better? Yeah, so most people know who Sean is, but maybe, Sean, you can introduce yourself and tell us a brief history of your amazing business. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, like you said, uh, the company is Golden Limousine. And it's always interesting because people look and say, wow, how many limousines do you have? And I say none. <laughs> uh, we actually don't have limousines in our fleet. Uh, we do have a lot of partners in the region that provide limousine service for us. But uh, our business is uh, group transportation and airport transportation. And we s take about 75 to 100 trips a day to the airport. Uh, intermixed with event transportation, athletic teams, uh, servicing, uh, uh, even sometimes weddings uh, with car service or shuttle bus service. So um, people logistics 
but uh, not necessarily the stretch limousine. And, and our origins were in that party stretch, night on the town, leisure limousine service, but that was typically a Thursday, Friday, Saturday type thing. And we realized we weren't gonna stay in business long if our uh, cars were only going out on Friday and Saturday. So, um, yeah, I, my story is very similar to uh, what I've heard so far from Mike and, and what I've heard from Ivy in that um, we had a successful operation. Uh, we, in uh, 2014, we won a contract with the University of Michigan and we've been their executive car service uh, ever since uh, through now we're in our fourth renewal of that contract. Uh, the um, university's uh, hospital, Michigan Medicine, uh, reached out to us. Uh, or actually, uh, we bid on a contract to uh, manage transportation of their doctors to the remote locations around the state, uh, Lansing uh, to Hurley or uh, um, Ascension Hospital, or as, you know, as, as uh, doctors need to go and fulfill their contracts uh, that they've created with Michigan Medicine, uh, where the service that will take them and so they can work in the back, uh, prepare for an operation or prepare for their for their day. Well, uh, we drive them to their to their destination, wait for them and then bring them back. So it was a huge contract for us uh, to win uh, at the end of the year last year. And we just thought it set us up really nicely uh, for uh, 2020. Uh, then we started a process of bidding on the uh, with again Michigan Medicine the parking contract, uh, meaning we were going to provide shuttle service for people who have to park off site and come uh, into the university. The university, obviously, uh, everyone knows if you're connected in any way to the university, has a serious parking issue, and uh, so they are looking for parking locations wherever they can, and then shuttle folks in. And uh, lo and behold, uh, we won that contract as well. Uh, that would uh, almost double the size of our business. Wow. So, um, you know, at the end of February, I was like everyone else. I was just thinking, here's, here's this thing out there. And we had forewarning because people on the East Coast were starting to tell us, hey, man, our, our business is way down. People are not traveling. And I'm thinking, well, everybody keeps saying it's, it's, it's just a bad flu. It's not going to be that bad. It'll be gone pretty soon. And all of those, those things we heard early on from so many of, of the experts. And I, you know, at the end of February, I took a trip to Florida for a golf trip. So I was not at all concerned. And then two weeks later, the entire world changed. Uh, and by the end of the month, uh, we were completely shut down. Uh, meaning uh, the doctors weren't moving. Uh, all trips to the airport had stopped. And, um, you know, I, it was just really difficult to sit in a sales meeting and look at all my sales team and say, I have to lay you off. And just feel, I mean, this is just before the lockdown, but, but to feel so awful that you're telling people that they have to go home and them looking at you and just thinking you're the worst person in the world. Um, contractors and saying we're going to suspend our contract and um, really, really difficult, challenging uh, conversations. And then uh, as the uh, lockdown came into place, we were an essential service, but one by one, we had to tell our staff, first reservation staff, and then uh, our dispatch staff, and then our detailers and our um, uh, everyone except for our mechanic and um, some key employees uh, were laid off. Well, God always looks out for golden limousine, and I believe that to my dying day because um, the first April first, uh, right after we had applied for PPP and and uh, the EIDL loan, uh, uh, I don't know if I can say her name. A major online retailer <laughs> located here in Southeast Michigan called us and said uh, we need shuttle service. And they gave us two or four buses uh, in two locations, 
every single day for 11 hours a day. Wow. It was huge. Uh, and it was, uh, so we, uh, like Mike said, we had a short runway in terms of cash. We had about three months of reserves, but holy Moses, uh, that went, uh, uh, the burn was, was quick early. And then we went into, you know, ultra save mode. We've got a, a small PPP loan and that carried us. But remember, we're providing services now. And in corporate America, when you provide services, they typically don't like to pay you for 30 to 45 to 60 days. Uh, so we were carrying all of that payroll, uh, insurance payments and bus payments through, uh, uh, through you know, that first 45 days of getting that contract. Now, remember, we've got the Michigan Medicine contract and we got the parking contract and we're thinking we're going to be OK. Michigan Medicine's not shutting down. Uh, the doctors need to keep moving around. But Michigan called us and said, listen, we're going to put this off another month. And holy Moses, did that scare the heck out of us because we had started hiring drivers and uh, started training and we had purchased a couple of vehicles that would help in the shuttle. And so we're completely freaked out because now we're at to wait another month for this program to start. And uh, so just fast forward to the end um, because uh, I really want to get into the, the breakouts. We, we received so much support. Uh, the PPP was very helpful, but Spark uh, uh, was able to get, uh, give us a grant. Um, the uh, online retailer paid us promptly. Uh, the University of Michigan has been great in terms of getting, uh, getting us paid quickly. And, uh, you know, it's still a struggle because it's a heavy lift. Remember, we, we burned through our three months of, of savings. And so now we're carrying payroll month to month. And it's a really, really unnerving. When you talk about the human side, you know, that's what keeps me up at night because I know that the people that decided to come back and work for me could have stayed home and earned their $600 federal check and their $390 state check. And it would have been more than I was able to pay them, but they came back because they were dedicated to Golden. So we can't have any hiccups in payroll. You know, we paid their health insurance the entire time that everybody was off, but um, you know, payroll has to happen. So it's just, that's the unnerving part for me is managing uh, continuing to try and manage cash, manage, you know, super high insurance and, and uh, working with uh, our vendors to make sure that they understand that payment sometimes might be 45 days instead of 30. So uh, from a people standpoint, I've got 10 more employees than uh, when the end of March hit and we had our lockdown right now, and we're looking to hire another 20 more. Um, it feels like a success story. We're, we're doing completely different work than when March uh, 26th happened, or March 26th. We're a completely different business. We're not doing any of the things that we were doing before. Wow. So what is, when you say online retail, what do they have you doing? They're, they're shuttling you? Yeah, it's simple parking shuttle, Rob. It's just okay. taking people from an offsite parking space to their uh, fulfillment centers okay. uh, in two different locations. But, uh, uh, we, but we, you know, it's really interesting, Rob, in that situation, um, it was a, a chat question. Uh, we have to social distance the bus. So we're using a 56 passenger charter bus to move 14 people. Wow. And uh, every other row and every other seat is marked off as, as a do not sit. And so you can fit 14 people on those shuttles. So we end up with a lot of people waiting, but it's because they, they want a social distance that we need these bigger buses. Yeah. Well, that's quite a story. How, how is your stress level, Sean? I mean, how, what are you doing to manage personally? Well, it's really fun. We're, uh, Alina is a, a, a golfer. Uh, she picked up golfing last year, and so we get to golf a couple of times a week. I have two, if you follow anything on, on Instagram or Facebook, you know I have two beautiful Goldens. So I start every single day with a uh, two-mile walk uh, with the dogs, 
Uh, and it's just a lot of fun to be out there alone with them and, and just start my day uh, clearing my head and, 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 uh, and walking around the neighborhood. Wow. They're very social too, so they know all the other dogs and we end up stopping a lot, but. Yeah. Wayne Baker, I think you're, uh, you're, you're taking some furious notes here. Lots of case studies for you to, to, to write up here I, as, you're ta as you're listening, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I was th I was thinking that um, I am taking have been taking some notes here the old fashioned way, and uh, yeah, since I'll be teaching my MBA classes entirely remotely, I'm trying to think of a lot of creative things I could do. So um, this has been uh, fascinating and uh, very helpful. Well, uh, hey, Robin, can I just say real quick yeah. too that one of the things about my company um, it's allowed us to establish routines. Uh, that we just were always too busy. Uh, it was always this crisis or that crisis or this, you know, VIP emergency. Or that. And now we have uh, routines, uh, routine meetings, uh, routine conversations. It's, uh, and, you know, I mean, you can, there's no excuse because you can Zoom from almost anywhere. So when you say I can't make that meeting, you're, okay, well, even if you're on the boat, <laughs> dial in. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, you really made the, the best of the time, and, and I'm glad that uh, somebody above you is looking out for you there because that, that was quite a, a nice thing. But, of course, your reputation was why they called you, so it all works together. So uh, I think uh, we're going to go to uh, – thank you for that, Sean. And, uh, Sean, when, we, when you, we get back on our feet, we'll have you pick us up in one of your – rented limousines and take Pat and I for a nice 50th wedding anniversary dinner somewhere, eh? <laughs> we'll definitely do that. And I mean, Sean has been, I've been a customer of Sean's for many years and it's just an amazing service. Uh, when we do get back to flying to have Sean's uh, really elegant people pick you up and uh, take you to the airport, meet you there. It's, it's a whole different experience than, than trying to drive. So, and not that much more money by the time you pay for a uh, car, uh, car being in the, uh, rental places there. So we're going to uh, go next to uh, uh, Brittany. Brittany out there. And uh, Brittany will be talking about her work with the universities uh, in the state. Thanks, Rob. Um, uh, I'm Brittany Apple McCain. I'm the executive director for Michigan's University Research Corridor, which is an alliance of Michigan's three largest research institutions, Michigan State, University of Michigan, and Wayne State. Uh, our purpose is really to foster collaboration across the corridor, connect researchers and innovation to industry, and um, promote economic impact through our university assets. Uh, so our job, we're a relatively small organization. Um, I am one of three full-time staff members uh, that, that here in Lansing um, at our office. But we contract out uh, for a lot of services, including communications and marketing, which is a big part of our work. Um, and we work very closely with uh, our, our uh, uh, partners at the university. So leadership, um, communicators, and of course we answer ultimately to the presidents. Um, so this, this time has been a challenge for an organization like ours where our job is to connect with people you know, almost every week we have lunch meetings to hear what's going on and to share information and, and get feedback. We're almost always um, asking uh, for our leadership and for our, our partners at the universities to engage in a number of activities, including uh, report, reviewing reports and, and other kinds of communications. And so right now, as I'm sure most of you know, and I know some of you out there I can see are actually at the University of Michigan or one of our institutions. Um, and Sean, of course, uh, alluded to some of the challenges our institutions are having. This is a, an incredibly difficult time for our institutions. And it is taking a toll on our partners at the universities. And we see it in every Zoom meeting and we can hear it on the calls. And so it is COVID all the time. So while we had a nice lineup of activities this year um, at the URC, we basically have put a lot of that on ice and we've pivoted to, to do the things that serve our institutions best. And that is to help them get the message out about what they're doing. And so um, actually I think you can see today as an example of 
Um, one of the, the things we've done, there's an op-ed that came out jointly from the three top medical experts at our institutions uh, in the Detroit News this morning, basically communicating the fact that people should not delay going to hospitals for uh, acute care, chronic care, or even preventative care. And so um, that's a really important thing for folks to, to know. Uh, so that's out there. We've had op-eds from our um, schools and colleges of education deans. Uh, we've had um, op joint op-eds coming from our presidents describing what is going on at the institutions in response to COVID, all the research that has been going on um, to fight this. So, so that has been uh, largely what we've been doing. Um, but I want to I want to talk a little bit because um, the human factor. I don't know about you guys, but um, has everyone? I feel like I have lived a lifetime in four months. I mean, this is crazy. So um, and so I, you know, it's 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 on the professional front, but it's on the personal front too, um, and and it's blended completely. So my two primary uh, staff folks, they both live alone. Um, and, you know, they're, and so isolating for several months was really hard on them. And I had to find ways to make them feel connected. Uh, while my house was a bit chaotic with my two boys at home and my husband, theirs was very quiet. And I had to be cognizant of the different experiences everyone was having on my staff, um, as well as our partners. And being respectful of people's time when everyone is on Zoom all day long, don't ask for another meeting just to catch up. It's got to have meaning. Um, and so that's, that's important. So finding the balance between connecting with people who need the connection, but, but uh, uh, balancing when people just don't have the time or the attention span to, to do one more meeting. And so always just kind of finding that with everyone and, and assessing individuals um, and what their needs are. Uh, I also, um, I had this thought and it is during this time, not just, not just staying connected to staff members and colleagues, but monitoring myself. And I think we've all probably been doing that too, mental health checks with each other and with, and with yourself. And that sometimes is not always in sync with your productivity level and understanding that productivity um, can be really high some days and other days it's not. It's just hard to catch. It's like smoke in the room. And so, um, you know, always looking at those things. And if I'm feeling that having a, a deep understanding as the leader um, that my staff and my partners probably have that feeling too. Um, and, and setting a different timeline for things has been important. On the home front, and this, is, this has been interesting. So my boys, are, um, I have a 21 year old who's going to be a senior in college this year and a 17 year old, nearly 18, who's going to be a college freshman. You know, this year was so strange to have them both home, um, doing, ending their school work online. My husband's a teacher at Ann Arbor uh, um, uh, Huron High School. And so uh, that transition to teaching at home, I saw firsthand just how challenging that is. We're all stressed. Um, and, but at the same time, it was a bit of a blessing because I can't, with boys that are on the precipice of launching their own lives away from us, to have this time with them has been um, joyful, honestly, um, even though sometimes I feel like I live in a frat house, but, uh, but it's, uh, and that's why I'm in my office, um, just to get out. No, don't worry, no one else is here, so no mask. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it's been, it's just been one of those things in, in, in being a parent um, to kids who on the one hand are seemingly doing fine with, you know, my youngest, no prom, no high school graduation, you know, who knows what his first year of college is going to be like. Right now they're still saying they're going to go uh, uh, on campus, but I, we don't know. And so it's, it's just always that not knowing. Um, has been challenging. So, um, so that's, that's with me. I did, while I have everyone here, do want to share one more aspect of my 
my life, my work life, and that is I'm also a board member of the Michigan Strategic Fund. And that has taken on a new um, purpose almost in that we have to have a number of emergency meetings to get things rolling through that were needed. In the beginning, we had to approve a, a $20 million emergency um, program, loan program for small businesses. And um, so we're responding as the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the governor and the legislature is responding. Um, and that has been very stressful to see the challenges so many businesses are having. And of course, that amount of money is a drop in the bucket. I think um, I saw uh, Jennifer Olmstead is on, uh, on here and she's at Ann Arbor Spark and she's on the front line of reviewing those applications. And so I'm really happy starting yesterday, um, the uh, state of Michigan launched the uh, restart, Michigan Small Business Restart Program, which is $100 million to help small businesses. And they also have $15 million going towards the Michigan Agricultural Safety Program. And you can look at those uh, if, you, if you have a small business and you're looking for some support. Um, you can go to uh, michiganbusiness.org slash restart to start an application. And again, I'm gonna pick on um, uh, Jennifer Olmstead at Ann Arbor Spark because uh, Ann Arbor Spark is one of 15 regional economic development organizations that are um, reviewing these and distributing the, the funding. And so um, I know she's gonna be very busy with her colleagues there in the coming weeks for this. And so um, that's my little uh, public service announcement about how we're all responding. Could you repeat the, the name of the Michigan uh, the, the website? Yes, it's michiganbusiness.org slash restart. Okay, we'll have all these resources on the uh, video we'll put out of this the Zoom cast, which will come out on Monday. Uh, <laughs> trying to keep up with all this stuff. So, uh, well, thank you, Brittany. And, and Brittany is part of a small group. Uh, several of the people who are on here have been part of small uh executive groups that I run, executive roundtables, and uh, 10 people each. And we had a very interesting conversation the other day about race and how that is causing uh, a lot of self-examination, uh, guilt, uh, re-examination of what we've been doing with our, with our, with our lives over, over many, many years. So uh, that was a pretty interesting conversation, I thought, Brittany. Yeah. So we're going to now switch. Uh, I, I'm I know we could talk and ask, ask questions to all these folks, but we want to give everybody a, a few minutes uh, to go into small groups. So Emily is going to transport us uh, into small Zoom groups where I think we'll have three each and we'll have, we'll take 10 minutes uh, to talk in that group about some of these same factors. And then the last 15 minutes from about 10, uh, 9.30 to 9.45, we'll report out and share any other resources that we that come up. So. Uh, prepare to be transported, put on your seat belts. Uh, if you're nervous, take a, a, an anxiety pill, but be, soon you will be, be transported. So. so I'm gonna go back and uh, maybe call on uh, any of you that, Mary, uh, you're always a good voice to report. You wanna report on what you heard in your group and what observations you have. Say a little bit about who you are and where you are. I don't think we could hear you. You got to turn. Yes, your there I am. I had to quickly get up. I will just quickly say we are in the consulting business companies called performance strategies group. And our focus really is to um, help people understand how they work. So that so in the middle of this whole uh, pandemic, uh, helping people get a handle on the language of how they work is really, really helpful because we have been kind of in a hockey stick of changing how we work. Uh -huh. So we, we help people understand um, the new environment, the kind of the communication, and what are these new assignments that people are gonna need to be in. So I was in the breakout with Matthew, and um, we, we really talked a little bit about, um, you know, that we're similar um, in doing consulting. I mean, mine, I could relate to Ivy, um, our organization is butts and seats, and um, it's it, it's just it's a change. And uh, so what we've been really working through is is the stress factor, and how is this stressing people out? 
and how can they get a handle on the language of it rather than just knowing I'm stressed, but being able to get up on top of the curve of what the stress means to me. So individually as a leader and then also as uh, team members, how can we support everybody on the team? Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna call on a couple other people just at random, but uh, Jay Paul, how about you? Who, who are you in a group with there? Maybe you could say who you are, what you do. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Jay Paul Dixon, and I have been a member of the community here for, for quite a while, and as well, our organization. So I work for Highland, which is Insurance and Risk Management Services. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of faces I recognize and have enjoyed the conversation today. Enjoyed the breakout because I it had included one of our speakers, Sean Duvall and uh, David Solz. I didn't get the pronunciation of David's last name, so I hope I, I haven't butchered that. Nailed it. Uh, but was, was I right, David? Right on, yeah. Okay, good, thank you. And, and so we had, a, we had a discussion about, of course, the impact on our, on our organizations, but a lot of our discussion stemmed around the impact on the people in our organizations. And uh, we, we talked a lot about the stress that's created both in the, in the political climate and uh, let alone the pandemic and the economic impact of the pandemic. And then we were just about to talk about a trip to Alaska for David and we got buzzed back into our group. So we're gonna have to pick that up, David, when we, when we have an opportunity. Okay. Uh, let's see who else out there. Uh, Jack Schutzberg, do you want to talk? Sch Schutzbach, is that, got to get that name, right? Yes, that would be me, but I'll defer to the other Jack Schwab. Okay, Jack Schwab. Yeah, this is Jack Schwab, and uh, just, I, I Jack uh, Schutzbach and uh, Ferris, uh, uh, Elami, we um, we talked about the difficulty of remote working, and um, we have a little different take on it. Uh, Jack uh, Schutzbach thought that you know really meeting in person is so much more valuable than meeting um, on Zoom. But this is what we have. Um, He's very anxious to get back to meeting um, in person. He thinks there's, there's so much more value in that. Um, Ferris, uh, on the other hand, uh, has, sent, without traveling so much, has made a lot more uh, local contacts and uh, really found it, I think, it, a struggle, but um, trying, really trying to make it work. So, I, and myself, uh, I'm going to try to do some student teaching. I'm retired, but uh, I've, I've been reading about the demand for uh, substitute teaching. And uh, I've called a couple of the schools and I've gotten tremendous uh, interest in having me help them. And I'm just kind of working now on how I want to do this. And one's a public school and the other two are private schools. And they have such different approaches to, uh, to how they're going to do their schooling. And I'm just trying to sort out uh, which one I think I'd be, uh, first of all, safe at, and the other, uh, just how they're going to do it. I think it's a huge challenge coming up here with the school year. And just to speak uh, to Jack, uh, Jack and I have known each other for probably over 30-some uh, years, Jack, at least, and uh, had been in a men's group for all that time, yep. and uh, we aged together. So uh, I know Jack and I have traded stories about glaucoma and other kinds of problems that we've had, but it's been a, been a fascinating run to go from pre-retirement to most everybody except me are retired at this point. So uh, Jack, thank, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, Kristen Story, uh, you want to report out on your group? Is Kristen still there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Rob, Kristen Story. Um, I worked for the University of Michigan and I retired last August and I'm an independent consultant. And so I had the pleasure of um, being in a breakout with Pat Rydell and Steve Schwartz, one of our presenters. And it was really interesting because what I um, 
what we talked about was um, just the challenges of being, you know, uh, for Steve and, and Pat, um, they're in organizations where right now they've managed to navigate um, the challenges in terms of maintaining their business now. But what happens long term? How do you how do you keep navigating that and um, um, trying to strategize how that's how they're going to move forward with creating um, continuing business? You know, for Pat, it's keeping those sub subscriptions up. You know, come January with the, I think the higher eds, Pat. I hope I got that right. And then for Steve, it's the long term continuous business development. So it's what I took from that conversation was um, and especially when you have to network to create those leads and the challenges of doing it virtually and um, you know really you know what I took was the savvy that they're going to need to really do that long term how do, how do you create that given the the challenges of you know a financial pandemic and a health pandemic and so hope I got all that right well, I think uh Let's see who I'm, Eric Fretz, are you out there? Maybe you could talk about your group. Uh, I am, yeah, I just finally figured out how to get my picture to show up, so. Okay. Um, now, having, a, having a hectic morning, as I told my friends, my, my mom is calling me in a panic about her computer. I'm like, I'm in a meeting, so she calls me back five minutes later. Are you still in your meeting? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm juggling that. But uh, we had a good meeting. Um, let's see, it was, uh, we had Christy, who, who sort of came and went through some technical stuff, and uh, Jan, and, um, Roger, is he still here? Yeah. So it was interesting. I missed the first part of it. Thanks, thanks to my mom, but uh, had some discussions about different things people were doing. I uh, I had shared sort of some of my stuff about uh, just dealing with helping helping some friends with some uh, healthcare and 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 um, uh, housing needs that ended up getting a couple of my friends infected with COVID, and one of them nearly died, and all that. So oh my god, that was kind of an adventure. But uh, and similar to what presented today, I, I was able to get some uh, PPP loans for my small businesses that kind of help them keep afloat because they can only pay your employees out of your own pocket for so long. Um, but uh, so it's been an adventure, but also we've been making the, making the best of it. I, uh, um, I think maybe probably Roger, Roger was kind of leading the group and um, had probably a better big picture of all the things we talked about, but I, I did find it interesting. Roger, well, anything, uh, you know, anything I missed? Better. Roger, you got anything to add? No, Jan was uh, started out talking about how she's uh <coughs> excuse me responding with their um uh, with their bed and breakfast and the extra things she has to do to be covid ready when it when you get if there's going to be like a football season <laughs> yeah well it's just extraordinary all the things that are going on and uh, i will make this uh, video available uh for people on uh monday and i'll try to write up a, a little bit of a dr rob although i'm going to go on vacation so i may just forget it next week and do it in two weeks, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to a time away with with all of my family. We're hoping we can all stay healthy and get together. Uh, I, I also want to make just a couple of announcements. Uh, one that I really want to talk about is my friend Ken Fisher, who most of you know, has today coming out a brand new book, uh, and he's selling it, uh, and all the proceeds are going to go to the University of Musical Society. So uh, if you want to get a an autographed copy of Ken Fisher's book, email Ken Fisher, and he's hand delivering the books this weekend. Uh, so any of you want a picture with Ken and his new book, uh, $29.95, all of it goes to UMS. And uh, Ken, as you know, is, is a wonderful person to talk to. So he'll be tuning around. Maybe you need to get Sean, maybe get him drive him around. Uh, he can offer a car for him for the weekend. And so he doesn't have to do it all by himself. I think he'd appreciate that. He'd probably give you a, a book in the process, Sean. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up for today, but thank you all for joining. And uh, if you have ideas for future topics, let me know. We're trying to do this a couple times a month. Uh, Leaders Connect is now online, uh, Zooming. Wayne Baker, uh, good luck in the teaching. Everybody else, good luck in what you're doing. And if you need anything, please let me know. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye, everybody.